you have your Bibles tonight, would you join me one more time in the first chapter of the Acts of the Apostles? I said this morning, weeks ago, I determined to, and I felt the Holy Spirit's leadership to bring a particular message on a particular Sunday morning on their resources, our resources. Talking about what the early church had accessible and had available to it. And we're taught throughout the Bible that what they had access to, we still have access to this evening. And uh, I wanted to drive that truth home. And I come back tonight to talk to us once again about their, their resources our resources. I'm reading one verse of Scripture, verse number 10 of Acts chapter number 1. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Now, three times here in this chapter, in verse 9, verse 10, verse 11, and also in verse 22, it says that Jesus was taken up. Now, I want to continue that thought tonight right after we have a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, through the name of Jesus, we approach your presence this evening. We're so honored that you have honored us to assemble once again in the house of God this side of eternity. Lord, again, I pray for all of these special prayer requests. I ask you, dear Lord, to minister, to bring healing. So many are sick under the weather. I pray you'll touch them and raise them up. And as has already been stated tonight, I pray for our president and his wife and those people around him who are having sickness that you'll bring healing and uh, uh, hurriedly so, rapidly so, to their bodies. All of the needs that's prevalent here this evening, please help us minister to those needs and these needs. Bless in the preaching of your word tonight. And uh, I'll thank you for it because I ask in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake, I make my prayer. Amen. The Bible is very clear that <clears throat> the Lord Jesus Christ suspended gravity down a little place called Bethany. And right in the presence of his own, he started to ascending up toward heaven. I've tried to picture that in my mind many times down through the years as I've read the Bible that must have been some wonderful day as they stood there, the Bible said in Luke that he raised his hands and he blessed them. And as he blessed them, he was taken up from them into heaven. Now, I believe when the Lord Jesus went back, first of all, we looked at it this morning on the first day of the week and presented his blood in the holy place. But I believe as the Lord Jesus left earth after 33 years in ascension glory and made his way back into the Father's presence, I believe it must have been a time of great rejoicing. Now, the Bible doesn't let us in on it. But you just consider the fact that for 33 years there had been separation between the Father and the Son. And all of this, during this time, he eventually suffered for your sins and my sins. He came out of the grave with the nail prints in his body. And now he's going back home to sit down at the right hand of the Father. I'd like to think that the angels welcomed him back I'd like to think that the Father, I know he did, welcomed him back into glory. When I think about this, I think about a story I read from a preacher down in the state of Georgia. 
many years ago at the end of World War II. He said uh, finally the war had ended and the soldier boys was coming home. And uh, a lot of mothers was at the train station anxiously waiting to see their, their sons as they got off of the train. And said so there was this one, one boy who became a hero during World War II. And he was such a hero that they gave him a special welcome when he came back into Georgia. They said at the train station, a local automobile dealer allowed them to use a brand new convertible to pick this soldier boy up and to take him to his house. When the train stopped, this young guy got off. They said the band from the local high school was there playing, welcoming him home. And they said when this young man stepped off of the, uh, the train and got in this convertible and they started down the street, they heard people on both sides of the street saying, Welcome home, Tom. Welcome home, Tom. They're glad to see him return. They said the cavalcade, other cars behind the, this uh, convertible, uh, went down the street and it went to a particular street and turned down a little side street and stopped in front of a little old small home with a little white picket fence out in front of it and said the noise out in front of the house caused an old gray-headed dead to walk out the door, stoop-shouldered and bent over. He didn't know exactly when his son was coming home and said he came out on the front porch and he looked out towards this convertible and he noticed this young soldier boy stepping out of the convertible. convertible. But there was something different about him as he stepped out. Something had changed since he'd said goodbye and gone to the foreign field to fight for the freedoms of this nation. It said when this young soldier boy stepped out of the convertible, they noticed that both of his uniform sleeves had been safety pinned up on his shoulder because in the service he had lost his arms. And said the soldier boy, kindly emaciated, came slowly, walked slowly out from the, uh, the convertible down a little old narrow pathway. And when the dead note recognized that it was his son, he stepped off of the porch, walked down the little narrow pathway, and the dad took his hands and reached out and took a hold of the nubs, just the portion of the boy, his boy's arms that was left. And he drew his boy close to him. And he put his arms around his boy. And he said, son, welcome home. I sure love you. And I've sure missed you. And it's good to have you back. When I read that story, I thought about the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe something like that happened. When our Savior left Bethany and he went up as they watched him back into the Father's presence. I believe the Father looked at his son now with the nail prints in his hands and his feet and the print of the spear in his side and probably scarred on his forehead where the crowns of thorns has pierced his head. And I believe the Father with his divine love in a very special way, welcomed his son back into glory. I don't know again. I don't know, I don't know all that took place. But my friend, I'm here to tell you that there was some kind of rejoicing. I believe the 24th Psalm to some degree depicts what happened when Jesus went back. It talked about lifting up the doors and, and welcoming the, the king back into the presence of the people. I don't know all that went on, but as he said his goodbye to his disciples and the 500 followers and others, as gravitation lost his hold and he went back towards the Father's throne, 
I believe there was a welcoming committee there that greeted our wonderful Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as he came down the throes of glory and found his place beside of the Father's throne. Now I said this morning, number one, the reason he went back to sit down to make the application with the blood was to save sinners. I want to give a second reason tonight, and then in a little while, I'm going to have you to follow me in the Bible. I want us to look in the Bible tonight as to what the Bible says about his ascension and uh, about his, the things that he's doing for us right now at the Father's right hand. But I want to say secondly tonight, our Lord Jesus went back to heaven and sat down not only to save sinners, but our precious Lord Jesus Christ went back to heaven to be there to intercede for his children. Don't say it again. He went back to save sinners. But he is there this evening doing what I call the work of intercession. Now I want us tonight to look at some passages of Scripture. I want you to see this firsthand. I, I just don't want to tell you about it. I want you to read it in the Bible with me. I want us to begin tonight again back in the book of Hebrews, the ninth chapter. If you'll follow me this evening, back to the book of Hebrews, chapter number 9, and I want you to notice verse number 24. Hebrews chapter 9, verse number 24. The Bible says, For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true. Now, if you'll notice up in verse number 23, it was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these. When God told Moses to construct the tabernacle, he told him to construct it after the pattern in heaven. And now we read in Hebrews 9.23, it was necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Look with me in verse 24. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself. Now, let's don't read over that. I want you to let it soak in. I want it to affect your sawdust for just a minute. I want you to notice what he said. When the Lord made his ascension, where did he go? This verse of Scripture says he went back to heaven. He's not somewhere in some kind of unknown location. It's very clear from this verse of Scripture that he went back into heaven. Now notice what it says. Now to appear in the presence of God for us. Now, that ought to help you tonight. Let it sink in. The ascension took place not only to save sinners, but the ascension took place that we might have someone in heaven on our behalf. We've got someone beyond this veil of tears. We've got someone who is vitally connected to us. We've got someone who is greatly concerned about us. Don't ever for one minute allow the devil to disgust you and to discourage you in that you don't think there's anyone for you or anyone on your side. I want you to know Jesus is on your side. And I want you to know although you don't see him, he is there, this verse of Scripture says, He is there right now appearing on our behalf. Many times when I've been in the courtroom, let me <coughs> explain this, not there to appear on my behalf, but many times I've been there to appear on other people's behalf, and I've sat in the courtroom and they'd say, 
You've got to be there like at 9 o'clock or you have to be there at 9.30. The moment that everybody gets excited about is when that side door opens because they know business is going to pick up. I remember being in Raleigh at the federal courthouse when we placed this lawsuit. I remember we were sitting there and suddenly we see this side door open. And Tripp, what is it that you hear at that point in time? All rise. All rise. And what's the hear ye, hear ye, remember that? There you go. There you go. There you go. You see, we have sound effects around here. And you always sit there in anticipation of that judge coming out. That's the, that's the big time. That's the important time when that side door is open and the bailiff does what Tripp just did. And that judge with his, with his garb on, he walks up on that, on that uh, judicial seat to conduct the court and everybody in the courtroom, they stand and they recognize that this guy has authority. This guy has power. As a matter of fact, if you show yourself, he can have you cuffed and stuff you because he's got power to do so. And everybody looks, they, they recognize that here's the judiciary, here's the man in charge. But I want to tell you something tonight. There's another place where there's a guy in charge. There's another place where there's a man in charge, and it happens to be our Savior. And the Bible says at his ascension, he went back. You say, but preacher, that's been 2,000 years ago. Yeah, but he hasn't aged any. He lives in the eternal present. <clears throat> Time, space, and distance <clears throat> has nothing to do with him. He's outside of that. He lives in eternity when he got up. Thank God he got up with a never-to-die-no-more body. He got up with a glorified body. He hasn't aged one day since he came out of the tomb. Jesus Christ, Hebrews said, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And since he went back and sat down here in verse number 24, it says that he is in heaven now to appear. He has made his appearance for 2,000 years. He was waiting for us to discover America. He was waiting for us to call upon his name to be saved. And ever since we've met him in salvation, ever since we have known him as our personal Savior, he has been there. Notice what it says for us. He wants us to approach his presence. The fourth chapter, well, let me just have you to turn back. Turn back to the fourth chapter of the same book. And notice with me, if you will, please, uh, what the Bible has to say. Uh, uh, look with me in verse number 14 of chapter number 4, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed, where did he go? Passed into the heavens. Uh, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tested as we are, yet without sin. Look at verse number 16. To this present Savior who's in heaven on our behalf, it says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. And the Baptist said, that's what the Bible says. He ascended to the right hand of the Father to be our great high priest. Now turn back with me. I'm giving you a lot of scripture. I want you to see it. I could quote it, but I want you to see it. And uh, if you have any problems finding the book, let me know, and I'll tell you the page number, Jackie. Now, turn to the fifth chapter of the book of Romans. Romans chapter number five. I want you to write these verses down. I want you to take them home with you. I want you to study these verses, uh, meditate on these verses because they represent what we have at the right hand of the Father this evening. Romans chapter number 5, and notice with me, if you will please, verse number 10. For if, oh, I love this one. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. I want you to watch this one closely. For if while we were enemies... We were reconciled to God by the death of his son. In other words, he loved us before we got saved. 
what, notice what it says we were. We were enemies. Why? We rebelled against our Creator. We were sinners. But notice what he said. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Now, wait a minute. If while we were his enemies, I want you to hear this. Are you listening? If while we were enemies, he was concerned enough about us to go to the cross of Calvary and die that we might be saved, the question is, if he would do that for us before we got saved, the question is, will he do any less for us now that we are saved? That's so good, I'm going to say it again. If he loved us enough to go up Calvary's hill and suffer our eternal hell and take our curse and our penalty, while we were his enemies, we wanted nothing to do with him. We cursed him, hated him, and despised him. If, and yet, if he was willing to go up Calvary's hill and die for us, uh, if he would do that while we were his enemies, will he do any less than that now that we become a part of his family? Well, this verse answers it. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, look at the two words. I love this. Much more. Not just more, but much more. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Now let me analyze that just a minute. Because some people have taken that out as context. He's not saying we're saved by the physical life of Christ that he lived for 33 years. We're not saved by his life. I, I, I hit that this morning. Uh, and thank God his life gave credence to his death. But it's by his death and the shedding of his blood that we're saved. But if we were reconciled to him through the sacrifice of Calvary by the death of Jesus... Uh, then much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. What's that mean? It means his intercessory life. He lives right now in the power of an endless life. And he, hear me, this is so good. He right now is a life, that's what it's referring to, the life that he now lives at the right hand of the Father. He is there alive to make sure as our intercessor uh, that our needs are met all of the way into glory. He is alive to make sure that the investment he has placed in us of conversion and salvation and the Holy Spirit he's placed within us and the divine nature he has placed within us he lives to make sure that his word is true when it says he which hath begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of salvation. Now, he is alive to make sure we're going to make it in, we're going to make it through, we're going to make it home in order for us not to. The throne of Jesus Christ would have to crumble, deteriorate, and exterminate, but he has an everlasting throne, Hebrews chapter 1. He's living in the power of an everlasting life to look after you and to look after me. He's in charge whether people will recognize it or not. The Lord Jesus Christ is alive to be with us the last mile of the journey. He went back to sit down to become our Savior. Now you're in the fifth chapter of Romans. I want to ask you to go to the eighth chapter of the book of Romans. I could spend the rest of our time here. What a powerful chapter. I want you to notice with me in verse number Verse number 31, we begin in Romans 8, 31. We're talking about the present high priestly intercession of our Savior. At his ascension, he went back and sat down to be everything we need for us. And here in Romans 8, 31, the question is raised, what shall we then say to these things? Now, what things is he talking about? 
He's talking about God safely protecting those who are saved all the way to heaven. And he uses words here that scare Baptists to death. If you'll notice, he talks about foreknowledge and predestination and calling and all of that. I don't have time to get into it. It's in the Bible, but it's not in there the way some people would have it to be. It's not a limited atonement. The Bible still says whosoever will. But I want you to notice in verse number 29, those he foreknew, knew, he predestinate, be conformed, uh, predestin, uh, foreknew, he predestinate, did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Look at verse 30. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, he called, those he called, he justified, whom he justified, he glorified. Now, if you're saved tonight, you're just, everything in that verse is true of you tonight, right now, this very minute, with the exception of the last word. We haven't been glorified yet. But I want you to notice, as far as God's concerned, it's already happened. Because if you'll notice in verse 30, the Bible said, those he also justified. Notice, please, that's in past tense. It's a completed fact with God. And those he justified... Notice it says he glorified. Everybody he justified past tense, glorified. God already sees his children, you and I, there in his presence, glorified past tense. As far as God's concerned, it's already an accomplished fact. You say, well, preacher, I hope I make it. You've already made it if you're saved. There's not going to be one Christian for the devil to gloat over when the trumpet sounds. We're going out. Now, some's going to go out bruised and scratched. And some's going to face the beam of the judgment seat with a loss of reward. There's no doubt about that. But I want you to understand, he's trying to get us to understand something here. What shall we say to these things? The things he's just talked about, a completed salvation all the way into the throne room of God. What shall we say about these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? You say, well, my previous husband's against me. You say, my previous wife's against me. You say, the guy I work for down there at the public work, he's, you, you, you start naming all of these things. So what you're saying is, what you're saying is, those things that are against you are greater than God's power to overrule. If God be for us, who can be against us? Now, where's this taking place? Same place at the throne of grace because he's looking after us. So those scenarios that we throw out there, that I, just, I just don't know this and I don't know. God knows. God's in charge. I like to tell that story about the preacher that was pastoring a church and they voted on the pastor every year silly stuff and so on this particular Sunday night they'd had some confusion in the church and the church was split every which way but it was time to vote on the preacher and so they sent the preacher and his wife to the house and he's waiting for somebody to come knock on the door to see if he's still the pastor and see if they voted him out and he's pacing the floor, and he's, he's rubbing his hands, his stomach's tied in knots, and his wife's sitting there and looking at him, and she says to him, Honey, why don't you sit down and just relax? Why don't you just wait until somebody comes and knocks on the door? Don't you know the Bible says if God can be for you, who can be against you? He said, That bunch of church members down there, that's who. Now, that's the way we look at life. Sometimes something comes along. It seems so insurmountable in our lives. And we must come back to this verse of Scripture. We have someone at his, at his ascension that went back 
and sat down, and Paul said he's there. What is there that can be against you is greater than his ability to help you. Let's look at it. Let's look at it. If God be for us, who can be against us? Now, he gives us a test here. He not only raises the question, he gives us the answer. The answer is, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up, for, I like this, us all. As my pastor used to say, that's you and all of us. He delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him freely give us all things? Now, verse number 33, listen to this. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? That's us. It is God that justifies. Now, here's the question. If God justifies us, and he does, Jesus on the right hand is the one who by his blood cleanses us and places upon us justification past him. If God comes on, on the scene in our lives and justifies us, the question is, what power is there in this world or the universe that can undo what God has already done for us? That's the question. Now, he gives us the reason why it can't happen. In verse number 34, one of my favorite verses in the Bible, who is he that condemneth? You say, well, the devil can, but he can't undo what God's done. You say there's the demons of hell. They can't change what God's done. They can't overrule God. They can't go into heaven and, and try to declare heaven in court to condemn us because we've done been justified in God's court and court's not going to be called in session anymore for the possibility to exist that we could be condemned. Anything the devil tries to call into court, the Lord's going to throw it out. He's going to say this court's not in session for you. You're justified. Who is he that condemneth? It's Christ that died. Here's the reason why we're okay. Here's the reason why the Lord Jesus Christ is going to see us through. Here's the reason he's sitting on the right hand of the Father. Who is he that condemneth? It's Christ that died. Amen and amen. Watch this. Yea, rather, that is risen again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There he is. He got up, kicked the end of the grave out, came out for us. Look at this. Who is even at the right hand of God, there's the ascension. He went up and sat down. He's at the right hand of God. Watch this. Who also maketh intercession for us. Who is it that can undo what's happened now that we're saved? Uh, who is it can go into the throne room of God and undo our salvation? Uh, because it is Christ who died for our sins. He was raised again. He ascended up. He sat down. He is there right now. Watch this making intercession for us. And when the devil comes before the throne, as he does in the book of Zechariah, as he did in the Old Testament, as he did in the life of Job, uh, and as he points out the faults and the failures uh, of God's people, uh, my friend, he will never be able uh, to change the mind of God. Why? Because Jesus is there. He can point to his blood and he can say, devil, you don't have any standing here. You're out of court. That fellow there, you're trying to convince his sins are under my blood uh, and you can't come in here and condemn him you don't have the authority to condemn him it is a settled issue he's already glorified as far as I'm concerned that's enough to cause a Presbyterian to shout amen he went up and sat down I love to hear old Dr. Bob Jones Sr. For years, we carried him on our radio station. What a blessing Bob Jones Sr. was. He got down to the end of his life. He had dementia. And the last time he spoke, they brought him out on the pulpit. He stood behind the pulpit, and he made a statement. And when he finished the statement, he made the same statement again. And when he finished that statement, he came back and made the same statement again. 
but it was a statement about God's love. It was embedded in his mind, although everything else was legal. No doubt Bob Jones Sr. tells this story. I read this just recently. I think it illustrates what I'm trying to get us to understand here tonight. He said there was a, a man, a young man, probably between, probably in his upper 20s, early 30s, back in the days when people traveled by train more than they do now. He was in, he was in the train, and it was about 2, two o'clock in the morning. It was very dark, and the train was clicker-clacking on down the track. And this man had a child in his arms, and the child is screaming. And the man is walking up and down the center aisle of this train. He's trying to console this child. And he's pacing the floor. And Bob Jones Sr. said, after an extended period of time, there was a man in one of the berths on that car that pulled his curtain back. And he stuck his head out and he said to the man with the baby in his arms, why don't you take that baby and put it in its mother's arms so she can comfort him? And the man didn't respond at that time. He just kept holding that child in his arms, walking up and down that center aisle. But what that man said kind of got on his nerves and with tears running down his face, he went over and he pulled that curtain back and he said to that man, Sir, I'd like to put this young child in its mother's arms and my wife's arms. But sir, I want you to understand that in the next car below this, the baggage car, there's a casket in there. And in that casket is this baby's mother. And in that casket is the body of my wife. Sir, I wish I could put my baby in her arms, but sir, it's not possible to do so. When that man made that statement, he said that there was another birth on that car, the curtains flung open. And a man put his feet down on the floor, put his bedroom shoes on, grabbed his robe and wrapped his robe around him. And he walked over to this man whose wife had died and the baby's mother had died. He walked over and he said, Sir, I'll take your baby. I'll hold your baby. You go get in your berth and you get you some rest. I know what you're facing. Because just a few years ago, I lost my wife. I had a kid about the same age. The kid's mom died. Sir, I know exactly what you're going through. Sir, I know exactly how you feel to be without a wife. I know exactly how your kid feels not to have a mother. I understand. I'll hold your child. I'll do my best to comfort your child. You go get you some rest. When I read that story, I said, that's just like my Savior. Whatever happens to us, we have not a high priest. The Bible says, which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was it, who was in all ways tempted and tried <laughs> and tested as we are, yet without sin? The question is, does Jesus know? Does Jesus understand? Does he know what it means to have a broken heart? Does he know what it means to lose a loved one? Does he know what it means to hurt? Yes, and thank God he's on the other side of the grave in a glorified body. He's at the right hand of the Father this evening. He knows. He understands. He enters into our feelings. He, enter in, he enters into our infirmities. Uh, he's a friend that's sick of closer than a brother. Uh, thank God he is next here door to us to help us anytime we need him. He's our intercessor. 
if he would save us, uh, he's certainly not going to save us to, to, to push us through this dark, forsaken, godless world alone. He's on board with us and he understands us. Thank God for Jesus. He's there tonight and he's there to help us and he's there to be with us. Aren't you glad of that? Man, I am. Thirdly, and I'm not going to push this one. I'm just going to give you this. We're going. At the ascension, he not only went back and sat down to save sinners. He not only went back and sat down to be an intercessor. But let me tell you thirdly tonight, our precious Lord Jesus Christ went back to heaven to be Lord over all. We've got a world that hates him. We've got, we got a world that hates righteousness. We've got a world that hates godliness and holiness. Well, I want to give you just a couple of scriptures right quick. In the book of Romans, if you'll join me there again, chapter number nine, I want you to see something tonight. There's no one like Jesus this evening, people. No one like him. We're going to prove it right here out of the scripture. Then you can go to Dario. I want you to see this. Romans chapter number nine. Paul's talking about his people, the Jews. I want you to know what he said about them. They're Israelites. Verse number four, Romans 9, 4. To whom pertaineth the adoption. What's he saying? Of all of the nations in the world, God reached down out of glory and he adopted the Jewish people. There was any number of nations that he could have called, he could set aside, but he decided to call the land of Israel. He's reminding them, Paul is reminding them of the glories given to them, the adoption, the glory. Moses upon the mount, the glory of God on display. In the holy of holies, the glory of God on display. Nobody else in the world ever experienced it. Glories. The covenants and the giving of the law. He never gave the law to another nation in the covenants, the Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant, the Palestinian covenant, the new covenant. He never gave those covenants to anybody else in the world. He gave them to his chosen people. No one else in the world ever received the law. Look at this. And the service of God. What's he talking about? The worship in the holy place. Uh, the services of God that he set on demonstration. Uh, and notice this. And the promises. No other nation in the world had promises like Israel had. Oh, my soul. I could go into that, but I don't have time. To, what, what's this? What's this? Whose are the fathers? What's he talking about? Israel had Abraham. Israel had Isaac. Israel had Jacob. Whose are the, all the heritage? These men called of God and set apart. And of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came. God adopted them, gave them the covenants, gave them the law, gave them the glory, gave them the services. Nobody in the world ever had that. But to top it all off, it was through them that the Messiah showed up one day through whom Christ came. But here's what I want you to see. He went back and sat down to be Christ over all. Notice what he says now. Who is over all? God bless forever. Amen. You want to talk about the greatness of Abraham? Then let me talk, you about, talk to you about what Jesus said about Abraham. Jesus said about Abraham, before Abraham was, I am. Wow. Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He's over all. He's better than Abraham. 
Pick out whomever you want to pick out. There's no one like Jesus. Notice what he said. He's over all. Now I'm going to carry that to another level here just in a minute. In fact, I'm going to ask you to turn over to the book of Philippians. We're going to carry it to the next to the next level. Hurry, I'm going to skip over a lot of things. I just want you to see this. The very familiar passage of Scripture, Philippians chapter 2. Here we're told about the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to, I'm, I think I'll close with this one. I, I'd love to have time to go to the Revelation and talk to you about it, but I don't have time. So I'm, I'm probably going to close here, but I want you to see this. Philippians chapter number 2. I don't want you to miss this, Jack. It's page number 1258. She already had it. But here we're told about what Christ paid to come down here. Let this mind, verse number five, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now what that means is, didn't think it was robbery. He didn't think that that position that he held up there with the Trinity was something that he had to hold on to, he was with. It's not talking about less deity when he came down here. There was just a position up there. He decided he was willing to give it up to come down here. That's what he's saying. He made himself, verse number seven, of no reputation. That's all he had before. I mean, he was, there was no sin in his life, but he made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness, watch this, of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He came so far down to this world. Here's what I want you to see. He went back and sat down to be exalted over all because in the condescension he came down and took on a physical body. Verse number 9, wherefore God also hath highly exalted him. And given him a name which is above every name. Watch it now. There's a lot of great names in the history of the world, but his name's greater. Given him a name which is above every name. Now I want you to notice, he goes into three different realms. And in these three realms, he says that everybody, every member of Adam's race in these three different realms, because of who Jesus Christ is, sitting at the right hand of the Father, that every individual in these three realms will one day bow their knee before the Lord Jesus Christ because he's Lord of all. And they will confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord and the only Lord to the glory of God the Father. Watch it closely. Verse number 10 that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Watch this first of all things in heaven. If they haven't already done it, the day will come when everyone in heaven in his presence will get down before him. I got a sneaking suspicion they've already done this. They're going to bow right in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they're going to recognize him as Lord. But not only in heaven, Things in earth. Well, there's some people on this earth, they think they're big wigs. They think they're big stuff. Nobody ever gets so big. But what eventually they're going to bow their knee before the person of Jesus Christ and they're going to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. Every God-hater, Chartiers, Hitler, Mussolini, you name them, all of the dictators of Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, you name them, Russia, you name them all, Khrushchev, you name them all, someday, someday, they will bow in the presence of Jesus Christ who sits on the right hand of the Father, and they will acknowledge Jesus Christ is Lord. But then he takes us down to hell. And notice, please, what he says. Not only things in heaven and not only things on earth, but notice what he said in things under the earth. He takes in all of God's creation. 
those who identified with Jesus, they're in heaven. Those who are living on this earth, those who've already died and gone to hell, there's going to come a day because of his exaltation and his seating at the right hand of his Father, there's going to come a day when every single member of Adam's race will get down on their knees in the presence of Jesus Christ and they will look up at Jesus and they will say, yes, Jesus, you're Lord. Yes, Jesus, you're Lord. Yes, Jesus, you're Lord. I'm going to tell you, friend, that's going to be a very humbling day for some people because they can't acknowledge it now, but they will acknowledge it then. He went back to save the sinner. He went back to intercede for us. He went back to have his person thank God, thank God exalted. And the whole world will acknowledge that someday. That's my Savior. Oh, Dr. Curtis Hudson, just before he died, stood, I think it was in the Northside Baptist Church down in Charlotte, North Carolina, and he sang the song, I'm on the winning side. His body was racked with cancer and eat up with cancer. And he was going, going out of this world not too long thereafter, probably one of the last meetings he ever attended. He died at his home in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. He told his family before he died, he said, I want you to put the plan of salvation on my tombstone. I'm going to write it. I want you to put it on my tombstone. When people come by and look at my tombstone, they'll still know how to be saved. But with a cancer-wracked body, he knew what I preached to us tonight. And he knew that he was on the winning side. And when the cancer had done its work, it couldn't touch his soul. Dr. Bobby Robertson, who's now in heaven also, he and I were very close. He, we were talking one day. He went by to see Dr. Hudson just shortly before he died. Dr. Hudson was there and said he had a very emaciated body. He'd lost so much weight. His voice was crackle, crackling and, and very weak. He couldn't, he couldn't hardly get over above a whisper. But he looked up at Brother Bobby and he said, I'm ready. There's nothing in the world like being ready. There's nothing as important as being ready. And he's there on the right hand of the Father tonight to make sure you can be ready if you want to be ready. He lives tonight as our intercessor. Thank God for our Savior. Thank God for Jesus.